she wanted to become a rabbi. Her life could be changed 100%, but she became investigative journalist. Please welcome, warmly welcome, Aisha from Bosnia. Aisha. Thank you. Thanks, Frannak. Um, hello, I'm Aisha Kehoe Down, an investigative journalist with OCCRP. I live in Bosnia. I'm actually from the United States, but thank you for um, the intro. Uh, I'm here to tell you the story of how I lost my first job as a reporter over a $40,000 toilet. Uh, so this was in 2015, and I was a stringer for what was widely agreed to be the worst paper in Cambodia. It was called the Khmer Times, and uh, it was a fantastic job. I basically, I lived in the northeast corner of Cambodia on the border of Vietnam and Laos, and no one read what I did. No one really cared what I wrote about. I spent most of the time riding around my motor scooter and drinking beer with the local authorities. Uh, there's one thing I have to tell you about the northeastern part of Cambodia, um, Ratnakiri, and that is that it is the dustiest place in Cambodia. So whenever you travel from Banlung, Ratnakiri, to Phnom Penh, people will stop you and they'll be like, yeah, you're from Banlung, and you'll be like, how can you tell? And they'll be like, well, there's dust all over your clothes. Um, there's no running water in the province. And so if you need to get clean or like, you know, have a proper bath, you go outside of town to a lake, a spirit lake, called Yeklaum. Okay, so there I am. I'm riding around my motorbike, drinking beer, no one cares what I'm doing. And, uh, but I began to realize after a time that something really bad was happening in Banlung Ratanakere. And that was the timber mafia. So the brother-in-law of the prime minister was running this racket whereby he was stripping the prime forest, which was really all the kind of best forests left in Cambodia, and selling the rosewood across the Vietnamese border into China. Uh, the wood would go for tens of thousands of dollars. Um, it was an extremely lucrative trade, but the result of it was that they were burning massive swaths of forest. There were a lot of ethnic minorities on the order of thousands of villages that depended on the forest for their livelihood, and they were getting sick. There was pesticide runoff in the water. Uh, there began to have a methamphetamines epidemic. There was a rash of suicides. And, you know, eventually I began to realize, like, this is important. Uh, you know, even though I'm just a minor reporter up here in the province, I want people to, to care about it. I want people to know what's, what's happening in this province. So it was about then that the toilet happened. Uh, so I was, I was there one day, having a bath, and I came out of the lake, and I saw, you know, at the corner of the lake, there was, um, there was construction going on. And, you know, I looked at it, it was a building, and then I came to the, uh, to the board of directors of the lake, that was Chirk, he was there, he was sort of the community leader, and I said, well, what's going on there? And he said, well, that's a toilet. I said, well, great, this place needs a new toilet. You know, the one we usually use has spiders the size of dinner plates. And Chirk said, no, 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 that's, that's not for you. I said, well, who's it for? He says, that's, that's for the princess of Thailand, Princess Surindhorn. She's going to pay a charitable visit to our impoverished province. She's going to donate a hospital. Actually, she's going to donate the building of a hospital. The, the doctors and the medical equipment will come from somewhere else. Um, and I said, well, well, okay, that's fantastic. And he said, she's going to, you know, stop by our magical spirit lake, and she can't use a normal person's toilet. She's the princess of Thailand, after all. So they're building one for her. I said, fine, fine. Well, he said, do you know how much, you know, the toilet costs? I said, no. He said, $40,000. said, well, that, that's, that's a lot. He said, actually, the whole project of the toilet, including the smoothing of the paths and the you know, building of the dock, that's a quarter of a million. But, but the building itself and the, the outhouse in it, that's, that's $40,000. So I did what you know, a lot of people in this room would do. I called my editor, Vincent. I said, Vince, look, uh, Princess, Princess Rindorn of Thailand is 
going to visit, they're you know, having a toilet built for her, and it costs $40,000. He said, sure, fine, you can have page three. So you know, I wrote the story. I called the governor of the province. They declined comment. I called Siam Cement Group. They declined comment. I confirmed the price with a jerk. He said it's $40,000. And then I called my friend Chani, who's on the Cambodian Rural Development Team. And I said, hey, Johnny, I got a question. Can I have a quote for the paper? And he said, sure, sure, sure. I said, how much would it cost to put in a, you know, a, a toilet in rural Cambodia? And he said, $200. And I said, no, 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 a, a nice one, like a, a very you know, fit for a princess. And he said, $2,000. So I said, OK. And that was the story, and I filed it, and it wasn't really a great piece of journalism, and then I got on the minivan to go to Phnom Penh to run some errands, and it was sort of a nine-hour ride. And while I was on this minivan, you know, trundling down the national road, I got a call from my friend Terry, who was a journalist formerly for Reuters, based in Phnom Penh, and he said, Asia, you know, there's a cocktail party for the, for the foreign journalists in, uh, in Phnom Penh. You ought to go. And I said, no, Terry, are you kidding me? No one respects my paper. No one knows who I am. Like, why, why would I do that? I don't, I don't want people to know what I'm doing. I said, no, no, no. You know, trust me. And so I, um, I went to this cocktail party. And there was the guy from AFP. There was a stringer for The Guardian. There was Deutsche Welle, I'm oh, sorry, DPA. And there was um, Ricardo from the Spanish Wire FA. And I walked in, of course. It was quite dusty. It was coming from Ratanakere. And, you know, they, they said, who is this? And Terry's like, guys, guys, this is, this is Toilet Girl. And they're like, Toilet Girl. And turns out, the story had gone viral. It had been picked up by a journalist who had been exiled by the Thai monarchy over Les Majest. He had reposted it to his, you know, like millions of followers. They had thought it was funny. It went on to Khao Soed English, and it went on to the Cambodia Daily. And then, you know, I gave my contacts to the nice people at the press club, and it, well, it's, uh, it's still there. In fact, that's my photo of the toilet. You can tell why I've never made a career as a photographer. Um, so, uh, um, it, was, it was exciting, and, and briefly I was like, wow, I've really managed to shine light on the problems of Ratnakiri province, or at least this toilet. And then I was fired. Uh, my, my boss wrote me an email. He said that I was, uh, you know, naive, I was embarrassing our paper uh, to our sources, and that he would only ever, ever commission food reviews from me, ever again. So then I retreated back to Ratanakiri province, where I discovered that not only was I unemployed and without running water, but also, you know, I had tapeworms. Um, so I'd, I'd like to take a step back here. I was, you know, trying to make this an inspirational talk. Uh, this toilet story has actually followed me around for, for years as my career as a journalist. It's kind of funny, I guess. Um, I'd like to say that, you know, things completely get better and, and everything went uphill, and, and honestly it did. Like, I, I was unemployed for a time and then I got work with the Cambodia Daily. Only then the Cambodia Daily was shut down by the Cambodian government over a trumped up tax bill and many of my colleagues had to flee to Thailand and um, uh, then the Phnom Penh Post was shut down and, and meanwhile, like, I found another job, but there were certainly more difficult instances since then and, but, you know, things have eventually gone well. I mean, I work for OCCRP, and it's knock on wood, it's a wonderful place. Um, I'd like to say, too, that, uh, you know, the journalism that we did in Cambodia really, really made an impact. Um, only, even after we reported on that timber crisis, it went on unabated. Uh, the two independent English language papers in Cambodia that I talked about, the Phnom Penh Post and the Cambodia Daily, they were closed. And the remaining paper, the paper I worked at, is now the main paper, English language in Cambodia, only it turns out that it has ties 
to the ruling party, um, the son of the prime minister. And in fact, the son of the prime minister had been texting you know, the editor throughout my time there and, and giving his input on the editorial content. Uh, meanwhile, you know, that same prime minister has raised the reputation of Cambodia by um, building an 8,900 pound sticky rice and pork cake to win the Guinness Book of World Records. And our friend Princess Rindhorn was recently given a Lifetime Achievement Award. Hold on. Cannot do that. Does not work. Next slide. There we go. By Xi Jinping. So, I'm not trying to be a downer here. Um, journalism is hard. Uh, what I can really say to you is, since losing that first job, I've met tens of people who've gone through the same thing. Some are in this room. Some are my colleagues. Um, most are far braver than I. And if we knew what we were doing, you know, would turn out well in the end, if we knew that we would actually make a difference and succeed, then maybe what we were doing wouldn't really be, be bravery. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to work for something, for a social initiative, for media literacy, for just the truth, speaking the truth to power. Um, and it takes a lot of bravery to do that, not knowing what will come of it. So, if you're in this room right now, you're in the best of company. Thank you. I'd like to introduce the next speaker. Uh, her name is Farida. She came from the United Kingdom and she's professor of Metropolitan, uh, Manchester Metropolitan University. Oh, Farida was trained to be horse whisperer, so she used to talk to horses, right? But you will not be talking today about this, unfortunately. Okay, please welcome Farida. Thank you. So what I want to talk about is some media literacy strategies that we've developed in the Visual Social Media Lab and how we've done that in terms of different countries and both short-term and long-term strategies. Okay, so one of the things that is really key to us, the name suggests this already, is that we're really interested in images. But when it comes to mis- and disinformation, images are key and very powerful vehicles of mis- and disinformation. And in part, that is because they are able to trigger emotional responses, um, and they are far more persuasive than other forms of communication. And it's because of this that they become such powerful vehicles of mis- and disinformation. And what we have seen across the world, both in the run-up to elections and in the aftermath of elections, in the aftermath of crises as well, is that a lot of mis- and disinformation stories are image-led. Now, the other thing that's really important about images is that they're also the lifeblood of politics, right? So politicians, especially in the run-up to elections, will use images in all sorts of different ways, both misleading, opponents will use images to discredit uh, their political you know, opponents, um, and here are just a number of examples of this. And one of the things that um, I think is really, really important is within the context now of mis- and disinformation, where images are so central, we also need to understand images in general. So what is the role of images in general in politics? Not just mis- and disinformation, but how can we become more literate in understanding images in politics? So another thing that's very important is to see this really on a spectrum. So what does this kind of visual culture around images and politics look like? And one way to describe that is to say the image of Nigel Farage using a very misleading way to talk about the refugee crisis and to suggest that refugees were on their way to the UK is potentially business as usual, right? Politicians, and I'm sure this is also very much true here, have always relied on using misleading images to sway the population and to get votes. Then we have the use of images as part of disinformation campaigns. Right? So this is a relatively new phenomenon in the way that we're describing it now, but in many ways there's nothing new about this either. 
What is new is this phenomenon around deep fake videos. So these are hyper-realistic videos that use AI technology and are seen as a kind of next frontier of information warfare. But all of this exists within an online space that is about images and politics. Now another way of describing this is a spectrum that takes you from low tech to really high end kind of manipulation techniques. Now one of the things that I think is really, really important to stress here, that as much as there is hype and concern around the deep fakes, it's this stuff that you really want to worry about. It's the images that are presented out of context, it's the low-tech um, videos that are presented in a misleading context, and because they're images, because they're videos, they're, is, it, they're exceptionally persuasive. And the countries where this plays uh, an especially important role is those that have low levels of literacy, where a lot of the communication is visible and a lot of the communication will be in closed networks like WhatsApp. This is where you have huge, huge problems. And a country that is often um, highlighted in this context is India. So what we have is a huge amount of panic around deep fakes. But what we really should be panicking about is the low-tech stuff, is the still images that are not altered, but are presented in misleading context. So in terms of policy responses, and I'm just focusing here on the UK um, and the EU, there's been a lot of inquiries, a lot of report writing, there's lots and lots of stuff that, that has been churned out. And one of the things when you look at these reports is that, of course, they're you know, trying to address this problem and they're presenting, so this is from the European Commission, they're presenting mis and disinformation as a multifaceted problem, but they don't look at images, right? In the, uh, in the UK context, this is a report from the House of Commons, images are seen as a related problem, but there's no discussion of them. So what we would argue is, if you don't fully understand the problem, how can you have a solution, right? Or how can you have comprehensive solutions if this central content form is not being taken seriously. And I see, I'm pleased to see a lot of nodding in the audience because when I give these talks, people intuitively, immediately understand that we're dealing with an online visual sphere where all of this stuff is swilling around. And if the, the, the visual piece is not being taken more seriously, you're just not gonna be able to find the most effective solutions. So one of the responses that we've had um, to this is that we teamed up with First Draft uh, and we worked with Claire Wardle on a relatively small scale project to look at the way in which images were being used in misleading ways in the UK and French elections in 2017. And we looked at 95 stories, image-led stories in detail. And one of the key findings that we found is that nearly 30% of these presented images with a false context. And what is even more alarming about this, when we talk about you know, the spectrum of low tech versus high tech, is that these were unaltered images, right? So these were photographs most of the time that had not been photoshopped, that had not been changed in any way. The only thing that had been done is they were presented in a misleading context. So what you see here is the mobilization of false context with a real image, right? So one of the responses that we had when we worked with journalists is to develop a framework that allowed journalists to specifically deal with images and with video, so with photographs and with video. And the idea of this framework is that you place the piece of content that you want to question, so you place the video or the um, photograph in the middle of the uh, framework and you go around answering these 20 questions. So these original 20 questions are applicable to any social media image. And then the questions in color are specifically around mis and disinformation. So to give people additional prompts, what are some of the things you might want to look at for these images in relation to mis and disinformation? Now, the thing that we hadn't banked on, so we launched this last year, is that this had enormous potential in, in terms of media literacy. And this was not our audience. This was not something that we had thought about. But when people were coming up to us and saying, 
there are no frameworks in media literacy specifically to deal with social media images, we got very excited and we thought, well, let us help. Let's come up with projects. Let's think about how we can translate this for a younger demographic. And one of the things about a younger demographic is that there is an, an ongoing assumption that so-called digitally native young people are really good at understanding this stuff and are really good at debunking information online. And what research is showing time and time again is that that actually isn't the case. And there's a really good report that came out last year, Fake News and Critical Literacy, um, in the UK that, that underscores that very much. Now the other thing that's important about this is to talk about the older generations in terms of who is actually sharing this content. And again, research is increasingly showing that it's older generations that are struggling potentially more so, but are, are more likely to share this and very um, problematically, of course, in democratic uh, societies, are the ones who are voting. So the impact of all of this stuff has genuine uh, consequences in terms of voting behavior. So if this isn't clear already, what we are advocating is to create a special space for visual media literacy. And to say that that is different from digital literacy, news literacy, general media literacy, information literacy, critical literacy, and it can sit side by side, but what we need is a recognition that the online landscape is largely visual. And everybody understands and knows that, but I don't think we have responses that are capable of dealing with that. And that is the space that we occupy. So one of the things that we did is we um, teamed up with an organization in Canada called Civics, and they are a nonpartisan NGO dedicated to building the skills and habits of active and engaged citizenship among young Canadians. So they specifically work with young Canadians. They have a project called Student Vote, where they're teaching kids about the voting process. So we worked with them and very much in connection to the upcoming elections, which are happening on Monday in Canada. So they have an already existing program, Student Vote, and we tapped into that to try and address this issue around images. So what we did is we worked with teachers and we translated our framework, which is quite complex, to a much more digestible framework that could be taught in primary schools. And that's what we came up with. We also gave it a, um, a different name, so the framework as it stands now in the Canadian context, is called questioning images. And we built a whole uh, set of resources around it. So we have a standalone one hour lesson, which has um, worksheets, it has um, example images that people can, can work through with all the answers, it has videos, it has a whole kind of suite of resources built out from the framework. Um, and one of the things that's really fantastic about civics is the way in which they train their teachers. So they organize these things called boot camps where they bring together you know, groups of people like we have here today and they expose them to the most cutting edge research in the kind of um, literacy space. And so I've been going to these boot camps since the beginning of the year um, to train these teachers together with civic staff. And so up until May, we trained over 500 teachers, many more now because they've had more boot camps in the run-up to the elections. Um, and we have some information from exit surveys. So we have nearly 400 completed exit surveys following these um, boot camps. And one of the things that um, has been really, really positive is just how enthusiastic the teachers were about this resource. So we exposed them to it, and then we wanted to know, would you use it? You know, what are the things that you would change about it? And 97% said that they would absolutely use it, with a further 2.7%. So nearly 100% of people said that, essentially, they would use it. So we had a really, really positive response to this. So if, um, Fast forward to this being rolled out at scale. So it's now in 9,000 schools. That covers 70% of all schools in Canada. So this, is now, uh, this now has the potential to reach potentially a million young Canadians, or up to a million young Canadians in the run-up to Monday's election. And it's also been officially endorsed by Election Canada. 
we didn't stop there. Civics was also running a similar project uh, in Colombia. Um, and again, I went to Bogota to work with teachers there to translate the resource as part of Photo Estudiantil, uh, their project in Colombia. And so the resource has now also been translated into Spanish and has now been sent out to 200 schools. So one of the things that we haven't been able to do yet is to understand what is the impact of these resources, what has happened in terms of people using it, right? And so that's one of the things that we want to do next. And we also want that to inform the next phase of our research projects. So one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to interview the teachers. What we want to know is how did you use it? If you didn't use it, why didn't you use it? Um, we just want to do reflective interviews with teachers. And one of the um, issues in terms of kind of limitations, and as an academic, I'm all about the limitations, is we can't talk to the students. That's very, very complex in the Canadian context. Um, and also, we have no baseline, right? So we don't know what we're measuring against because that wasn't measured. So we don't know what were the skills that the students had before this intervention. And the only way in which we're going to find out something about the intervention is speaking to the teachers. So we recognize that there are limitations, but that's the best we can do under the current circumstances. So trying to rectify some of that, on a much smaller scale, we're rolling out a project in the UK, working with three schools in Manchester, which is where I'm based, to work on a much more comprehensive six-week um, intervention where students will be exposed to per year. So in, in the UK, we have different year groups going from year one to year six, where they will each year get six hours of visual media literacy training. So if that student stays with that school, by the end of their um, uh, year six project, they will have had 36 hours over six years of this intervention. I mean, that's the dream. We'll see if we'll, uh, we can do it. But one of the things that we would really like to do is to take this holistic approach to work with the whole family. And one of, the way, one of the reasons we want to do that is to get at the grandparents, to get at these older generations who are the sharers, who are the predominant sharers. And so we want to develop a set of resources that the kids can also take home and also can involve the whole family. So we have a very ambitious methodology um, for this project. We want to do in-classroom observations we want to interview teachers after they've delivered the lessons. We want to talk to the teachers in focus groups. We want to talk to the parents in focus groups. We want to do interviews with um, the, the pupils, of course. And we want to create a baseline. So we want to understand what do the pupils know before the intervention, what do they know directly after the intervention, and what do they know a number of weeks after? Have they actually remembered anything, right? So very, very comprehensive. We want the parents to keep diaries. What are the kids doing at home? Is this triggering new conversations? Are they getting grandparents involved? We want to do in-depth interviews with both parents and the key teachers working at the schools, and we want to round this off with a kind of mini festival at the school that involves the whole family. Right? So we're thinking about quizzes, where the whole family can be involved in a quiz. We, uh, we're thinking about, you know, like, are there pictures that you can bring from your grandparents? We want to try and have an as inclusive and as holistic conversation with the whole family about um, images. And then in the, in the following years, we can't replicate this every single year. The idea is to come up with a methodology that still allows us to track what is happening with these kids, but with a lighter touch. So the key goal of all of this is to generate robust, rigorous data over time to actually understand what, the, understand what these interventions do. We don't know because we're not measuring it and we're not critically asking these questions. Are they doing any good? Are they improving the situation? And worse still, are they maybe making things worse? 
Are they switching people off? And we need to ask ourselves these critical questions. And I think that um, one of the things that is really, really important is the urgency for this, right? So there is momentum building, but if we don't baseline this stuff, if we don't over time measure and critically measure with proper methods, then I have concerns about where we're gonna end up. And this is one of the things that um, we would like to contribute. If you're interested in becoming involved in any way, if this is something you would like to trial through your organization or in your country, please get in touch. Thank you. So now I wish to invite here Tom, Tom from Midan. Tom, are you here somewhere? Yeah, yeah, I was looking for Tom and all the whole day. So uh, Tom managed to unify, I think, to all the major media outlets in Mexico, right? Somehow, and before elections 2018. So 90 newspapers and websites used to work together to verify electoral campaign. So I think it's impossible in Belarus, the same as impossible in many of our countries. And I hope Tom will share the secret. So that's the remote control. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in uh, Minsk, and um, I'm going to try and try and be brave. I'm not going to talk at the Media Literacy Solutions Forum about media literacy. Um, I'm going to talk about da 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 misinformation literacy, um, and I'll explain a little bit about what uh, I think that is. Um, I'm uh, very fortunate uh, in the job that I have, which is basically I get to um, travel around the world and work with journalists um, to come up with uh, projects and initiatives that work to um, build collaborations around the challenge of finding and uh, debunking um, uh, viral misinformation, particularly around elections. And I'm going to talk today about a project I worked on uh, last year in uh, Mexico with um, Anima Politico, who are an amazing investigative reporting uh, unit, um, with a team of fact checkers, um, and with uh, AJ Plus Español, um, which is the uh, Spanish language um, uh, team at AJ Plus. Um, we did it with support from Google News Lab, who I think are here, um, and the Facebook Journalism Project. And the goal of Verificado was to see if we could assemble a big uh, coalition of uh, Mexican media, whether it's TV, um, digital, um, uh, radio, around this challenge of um, finding um, the, uh, the misinformation, the disinformation that was being spread by actors inside and outside Mexico um, and see if, see if we could uh, debunk it. Um, and this is in the context of kind of uh, post Cambridge Analytica revelations where it was clear that they were trying to be active. Um, and Mexico actually has a long history of uh, using social network uh, manipulation to pollute the information ecosystem to try and um, uh, to try and manipulate public opinion ahead of elections. Um, the team was amazing, uh, they're great. I'm not gonna talk too much about um, what we did um, because um, I, I actually rarely think about uh, what I do in terms of media literacy, um, but so I was very happy to be invited to this event and um, try and think about um, what aspects of Verificado um, related to media literacy. Um, and it made me think about um, the kind of thing that surprised me most about Verificado, um, which was that in addition to all of the amazing fact-checking work that we did and all of the uh, debunking work that we did and all the things that we found um, and all the investigations that we did, um, the most successful uh, content that we produced um, was actually um, around uh, how does misinformation work? Uh, and, uh, uh, and how can we understand how people are manipulating the information ecosystem? And uh, AJ Plus, uh, led by my colleague uh, Alba Moraroca, who's an amazing um, visual journalist, uh, produced a whole series of videos that I want to show you. Now, they're all in Spanish, and so um, you don't need to listen too much, um, but the team at AJ Plus is really great at making um, very, maybe turn the volume down a little bit. Is it possible to volume down on the video? Um, 
The team at AJ Plus is really good at making uh, videos that contain a lot of information, sometimes about complex topics, and packaging it into very um, compelling and interesting and visual and engaging uh, videos. So in this video, um, which is a bit jumpy, uh, Angel is talking about some of the ways um, that audiences can, some of the clues that they can look out for when they're um, uh, looking at uh, the content that they're seeing on Facebook or on WhatsApp. Part of the, the goal was to uh, help audiences do some of this work themselves, raise the kind of public awareness about what they could do. Um, we also published a whole series of videos that explained the different ways that people, um, uh, uh, actors, political parties, um, could manipulate uh, the uh, uh, social networks. Um, so in this video, we explain how botnets are used to create uh, fake trending topics on Twitter, which is a big platform in Mexico. Um, and this is used by political parties to um, uh, create a fake perception that one candidate is very popular um, and to attack uh, other candidates. We also uh, worked in kind of a related way to how Farida talked about um, to cover, uh, explain to audiences why we were verifying memes and why we were debunking memes. Um, so a lot of the content that we were seeing um, was extremely visual in nature. Um, and so we decided at some point that it would be really useful to the audience to understand that dynamic uh, and to try and explain a little bit about why we were taking uh, so much time to investigate these memes that were being shared on WhatsApp and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, and again, you can see uh, I think a really important point here is that um, the videos that we're creating, they're not talking about simple things. Um, they're talking about, you know, this is talking about memetic misinformation. It features um, my colleague Anne Shamina. Um, but it's produced in a very compelling and visual way. I think this video was viewed something like 400,000 times um, over the course of uh, uh, the six weeks of the project. Um, what this shows is that actually there's a real audience appetite for this kind of content. Audiences want to know um, how they're being manipulated and how people are using this space. And there's value in um, media groups and projects like Verificado explaining that to the audiences. We also sought to tell some of the human stories around misinformation. So um, in Mexico, bots can both be uh, fake accounts on Twitter, but it can also be people um, who are paid by political parties um, to post uh, content that is pro or against uh, a given candidate. And so we found three bots three of these people that were being paid by the campaigns, and we interviewed them and we spoke to them about why they were doing this work, what it was like to do this work. Um, and this, again, it's, it kind of shines a different light on the um, misinformation, uh, uh, the misin mis misinformation space. We also uh, developed uh, a kind of glossary of terms. There's a lot of confusing technical language around misinformation, bots, trolls, sock puppets, decks, uh, turf. Um, we uh, created these visuals uh, for, for specifically for Twitter uh, and for Instagram that explain to people what, what these different words uh, meant. And this was actually in response to um, the first video I showed about how bots were being used to um, float trending topics. We got a lot of questions from the audience. They're like, what, what is a bot? What is, um, what is a, uh, a sock puppet? What is a troll? Um, and so we try to uh, explain to the audience um, what these different words mean and the different uh, ways these terms were used. Um, we also used the, um, the, the content that we were debunking rather than just saying, um, this is false. We use that content to explain um, how, we, how we spotted that it was false and also to show how these fake images, how these manipulated content uh, are created. Um, so this video, I think it was viewed like over 200,000 times, um, shows how easy it is to use Photoshop um, to manipulate uh, an, 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 uh, an image and what clues you can look for uh, when you're looking at an image. Um, this video, it was the single most viewed piece of content that Verificado produced. It was uh, viewed uh, just over two million times um, from the project. And it's super simple. All it shows is how um, uh, a regular person using their mobile phone can do a reverse image search. 
Um, and it's, this is a, that was a real piece of content that we found that was going viral. It was basically saying, uh, Adidas is making trainers that supports one of these parties. Um, and this video, super simple, shows how you can disprove that as just a regular person. Not, it's not aimed at journalists, it's not aimed at professors, it's just aimed at uh, people who are seeing this kind of content. Um, and I think the scale of the audience um, for, for this particular video and how many times it was shared and how many times it was viewed showed that there's a real uh, opportunity here to um, uh, support this kind of content and uh, there's real value in it from the audience's perspective. So what I want to encourage people to do uh, today, uh, particularly people who are journalists, um, is uh, there's a real opportunity, I think, to um, explain to audiences not just when something is fake in isolation, not just that this fact is wrong or that this video is fake, but to also explain how these things happen um, and why they happen. This is a really good example of this from um, the Washington Post who recently published this guide on um, different types of manipulated video. Um, uh, and I think there's, there's a lot more room for this kind of content. Um, just very quickly, I think um, the lessons I've learned from uh, working on, on this project in Verificado is that if your um, misinformation literacy content has to be um, extremely visual, extremely engaging, um, it's, we benefited because we were tying it to relevant content. We were using examples from the work that we were doing journalistically and incorporating that in this kind of misinformation literacy content that was actually much more popular than the debunks that we were producing themselves. In terms of distribution, I think um, one reason that the videos and content that we produced around misinformation were so um, widely viewed was that Verificado was not viewed as a media literacy project. It was viewed as a publishing brand. We had a high profile. Uh, we were kind of seen as um, a, a media organization, which we were for um, about uh, six weeks. Uh, and so incorporating misinformation literacy content, not as a discrete field, but into the daily work of reporting, um, was extremely successful. Um, we also used the project distribution network as 90 um, media organizations and civil society organizations across Mexico. So the content that we were publishing had a very, very wide reach. Um, we also present, uh, had partners in 28 of the 30 states in Mexico, so we had a broad uh, geographic um, group. And we were publishing on Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, all these channels. Um, now, the, the, the piece of motivational, <laughs> uh, the motivational part of this talk, um, uh, and why I think misinformation literacy is particularly important. Um, there's, there's some narratives that disinformation doesn't really have an impact and media literacy doesn't really have an impact because in isolation, if I just see one given fact or one, one piece of fake news, then probably I'm not going to be persuaded by it and I'm going to be, I have my own uh, fixed point of view and my body maintains your kind of point of view in the same way that it maintains your body temperature, in the same way that it maintains your body uh, heat, uh, your, bo your body weight, for example. And Mike Caulfield, who writes about um, misinformation literacy, um, had some really great uh, articles that he put out in December that kind of challenged that. Um, and he basically made the point that it's not one piece of fake news in isolation um, or one uh, uh, politician lying in isolation. Um, it's the collective impact. It's the drift. Um, and over time, when you're exposed to this stuff over and over and over and over again, um, you're, the, the fixed point that you usually have, it starts to shift and it starts to drift. And that that's a very um, compelling and powerful dynamic. And we see that with the kind of wave of disinformation. We know that disinformation actors know this. Um, and they, they try and flood networks with disinformation. It's not about any given story. It's about fundamentally undermining the trust in any information and the trust in any journalism. And so I think if we're going to uh, push back against that, if we're going to build a sense of resiliency, um, then I think media literacy is, is extremely important. And I think um, misinformation literacy as a kind of potentially nascent uh, subsection of media literacy uh, can go a long way to helping. Thank you very much. Please welcome Aaron Sherikman. Thank you. Thank you, Frenick. Okay. Um, so uh, it's, hello. It's great to be with you all. 
Uh, Franek asked me to give a 12-minute inspiration talk, and I decided I could do it in 30 seconds in one slide. It's a picture of beer with uh, facts matter on the glass. So I think we're, we can leave. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Aaron Sharakman. I'm the, my day job is I'm the executive director of PolitiFact. PolitiFact is the largest political fact-checking website in the United States. Uh, we've been around since 2007. And uh, anyone, please let me know if Donald Trump tweets in the next 10 minutes, because I'll probably have to get straight to work. Um, uh, we've published more than 17,000 fact checks uh, in 12 years, um, and it's been a lot of fun becoming experts on all kinds of things. Um, but here's the truth. Uh, as a professional fact checker and a job that I love, uh, we've also realized that we cannot alone solve this. Um, uh, there, as I talked about, uh, if you were with me yesterday, there are millions of examples where, uh, or maybe not millions, let's say thousands, uh, of examples where fact checkers have corrected the record, where there's been misinformation shared and fact checkers have come in and said, no, that is false. Um, and I believe in every one of those cases, more people saw the misinformation than the fact check. Uh, so this alone, fact checking will not solve it. So we started another thing. We called it MediaWise. Uh, and it is a media literacy project aimed at middle and high school students in the United States. Um, we've been around for a year. We've trained 15,000 people, uh, kids, uh, in schools. We're helping develop a curriculum with Stanford University. And we're actually teaching uh, a network of high school students to be fact checkers. Uh, so around the country, there are today about 100 students who are every day finding information online and fact checking that information, and then publishing their findings on Instagram through video stories. Uh, so it's a really cool project and something I'm, uh, I'm really proud of. Um, I won't be talking about it anymore, though, today. Um, I bet you uh, a lot of us kind of feel like we're losing, right? We're in a field, um, whether you're a journalist, uh, you're an educator, you're a civic activist, you're in a place where the inconvenient lie is way more popular than, uh, the reassuring lie, excuse me, is way more popular than the inconvenient truth. Um, I feel that way too. We live in a time also in the United States um, where uh, a top advisor to the president, Kellyanne Conway, uh, developed a term called alternative facts. Now, I don't know what this means exactly other than to say, I don't know what this means. <laughs> You've heard this in other ways, right? We've heard the talk about the post-truth era, the era after truth. So um, that's also, I would say, uh, doesn't make me feel very good. It probably doesn't make you feel very good. Uh, we also have this uh, amazing quote from uh, everyone's favorite U.S. president, Abraham Lincoln. Don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. Now, you might be depressed, but I bet you, if we uh, polled uh, the U.S. audience, I bet you there's a percentage of Americans who believe this to be a true quote. I really do. So we are living here kind of what? At the end times of truth, right? That's kind of the story. Um, a lot of people who cover uh, either the intersection of media and politics or the people who write about misinformation online uh, peddle this narrative that the sky is falling, the deep fakes are here, uh, and uh, quite frankly, citizens, voters, viewers, readers are too dumb to tell the difference. I mean, I think that's, that's a story that I've read probably a hundred times. I don't believe it's true, but I think overall it has this feeling a little bit like this. I think Farida had like the woman who was like, ah, I guess I had the guy who's like, ugh. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so we're in a little bit of a, a tough spot. I think that's the public perception of why we're here. Um, my inspiration talk, if you will, is to counter, kind of counteract that narrative. 
Um, thank you. So I'm a big believer in this. Uh, small wins can have big impact. Uh, after the 2016 election in the United States, a lot of people, a lot of reporters, my friends, um, came up to me or asked me a question. They said, Aaron, you're a professional fact checker. You fact checked the 2016 presidential election. By any objective measure, any objective measure, Donald Trump told more falsehoods, lies, false statements than Hillary Clinton. Yet, Donald Trump won. Don't you feel like you failed? And I would always say, no, it's not what I was trying to do. I wasn't trying to get people to uh, have people tell people how to vote or change how people voted. And I, it really made crystallized for me this point. That sometimes I think in this room, we maybe talk about the goal in a little bit of too big of a way, right? Um, it's easy to say the goal is end fake news, solve the problem of misinformation and disinformation. I would argue that's impossible. I mean, politicians and people have been lying since they've been able to speak. Uh, everyone has been lying on the internet since the day it was invented. I don't think we can solve for that problem, right? Um, and I think sometimes, by trying to think about it that way, we kind of get ourselves in trouble. We get to tie ourselves in knots. Uh, and I, I hope we can think about this maybe in a different way. I like how it, bu it does buzz when it changes. That's kind of fun. <laughs> uh, we cannot be paralyzed into failing to act. I think this is a thing that I see a lot, that a lot of people say, I can't solve for the problem, so therefore, what's the point? Uh, another way it manifests itself is a, a reader, a viewer, a voter goes online and realizes now today, thank God, that there is fake news. But then they just say, well, I don't know what to trust, so it doesn't matter. I'll trust what I believe. We're no better off. We have to do something, and, we have, we, and small things can be successful. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, I'll say, I'm just going to do this and quickly. Set reasonable expectations. If we, if we define the goals in more step by step by step, then thinking about the overall goal, I think, will be much better off. I want to walk you through a couple things. So these are just things I think about. So one, I think bad is the idea is we can change people's opinions. Okay, so if there's a policy on the books in Belarus or in the United States that is based on false information, if we work hard enough as an institution or a group of educators or journalists, we can change people's minds. I think it's a completely wrong and backwards way to think about it. I think we should be thinking about how we can shape opinions. So I always talk about this. We have our beliefs and we have our facts. And what I just want us to get to is to a place where we all agree on a common set of facts. And from there, whatever you believe is your God-given right. But what happens all too often is we start with our beliefs, right? And we go in search of facts. And when we go in search of facts on the internet, the internet will always provide, right? Uh, and it might be a true fact, but only, but only part of the story. It might be actually misinformation. It doesn't matter. We need to start with a common set of facts. Uh, and if we do that, if we do that, I think we can help people reach the conclusions that they want to reach, but based on uh, a common language. This is, uh, this is my poster child for this. This is a lady, uh, she was at a Trump rally in Nevada. Like, okay, this is a person who I could never convince not to vote for Donald Trump, right? But I should never be trying to do that. I should be helping her understand more about the economy or immigration policy. And she can find any reason she wants to, to vote for Donald Trump. I just want her to find factual ones, right? Not ones that based on lies or rumors. We hear this all the time. If we only had more money or more resources, we could do good. I think this is kind of a, I'm sorry to say it, but I think this is kind of something that like, we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel better. Real change happens person to person. Who are the people you are most likely to believe? It is always the people that you know.
right? Because the people that you know are the people you're most likely to trust. They are the people who, like this beautiful, all-white family, very happy with their iPads, uh, middle class. <laughs> we can make real change by having conversations within our family and friends. One of the things I talked about yesterday, which I think is really important, is that you probably all know someone online who shares misinformation. Probably not on purpose, but they do it because it agrees with what they believe. And in most cases, I would guess that what you do is you probably see that and you're like, eh, that's my crazy uncle again, or that's that weird friend who I hang out with sharing misinformation. I'm not going to get involved with that, however, because it's family, or I'll never change their minds, or I don't want to waste the time, right? My argument is that we should invest that time. We should invest that time not in telling someone they're wrong, but asking them where they got their information from, presenting them other sources of information, and then uh, presenting information about their source, right? It may not solve for them, but hopefully down the road, somebody else will read that post and maybe there will be a connection. This is one I hear a lot. Um, it's a good one. Uh, it's up to tech companies. They can solve this in a second. Um, I, I, really, I really don't like this one. Um, I think that there is a responsibility among the big tech companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, um, to react and to develop solutions that we can implement, but we just can't blame them, right? Um, as my friend, ah, your friend, Billy Joel once said, he didn't start the fire, we didn't start the fire. This has been something that has been going on and on and on. It looks a little different now, of course, because of the speed at which information can travel online. But in 2012 at PolitiFact, we weren't fact-checking viral memes that were spreading on Facebook and Twitter. We were fact-checking chain emails, emails that spread at the rate of your address book, right? Uh, the same type of misinformation just packaged in a different form. So Houston, I think we know there's a problem. I'm a big believer that if we go one step at a time, uh, thinking about realistic uh, and uh, achievable goals, uh, we can make real big impact. So that's it, Fronik. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to invite here Victoria Baker from the United Kingdom, please. Uh, she represents Newswise Project, right? So, Victoria, floor is yours. Um, so I'm one of the program managers for Newswise, and Newswise is the first free UK news literacy program for 9 to 11-year-olds. We are a partnership between the National Literacy Trust, the Guardian Foundation, and the PSHE Association. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and we receive funding from Google.org, which means that everything that we do is free for all schools in the UK. To do this, uh, our aim is to create a generation of news literate young people. And to do this, we work with schools, communities, children, their families, and teachers. We create lessons and resources for teachers to deliver news literacy projects in the classroom. We train teachers on what effective news literacy education looks like. We run workshops for children and their families, and we help to connect journalists with schools. So we help children to become fake news detectives, but we don't just cover disinformation. We also support young children's understanding of the news. So what is news? Why is it important? How is it produced? We also work with children to help them identify bias, opinion, rumor, and speculation. And we teach them how they can use new skills to have a voice in their own communities and share their own true stories in a fair and balanced way. So we have four key underlying principles. Firstly, we want children to engage with and enjoy the news. We want them to take pleasure in understanding their world. That's the foundation of everything. From there, we want them to have the critical thinking skills to question everything that they see, hear, and read in the news, in the same way that they're taught to critically question poetry and literature in the classroom. And we want children to be empowered to have a voice in their own communities. 
But what's most important is that we recognise that some schools in the UK are facing particular challenges. So we target our face-to-face -face work with children in the hardest to reach communities. So those facing social economic deprivation, digital poverty and those communities that are traditionally underrepresented by mainstream media. So why do we want to do this? Well, we know that fake news is a real problem. It's definitely not a joke. Research in 2018 from the National Literacy Trust found that only 2% of children have the critical literacy skills that they need to identify a fake news story. But helping children to become fake news detectives, you have to be fun, authentic and relevant. So I'm going to show you some of the ways that Newswise achieves this. So firstly, authenticity is key. Children need to see the purpose in their learning in order to be motivated, engaged to learn in the first place. So we ensure that all of our lessons are embedded in the real life skills of the newsroom. So when children are learning to edit their work, they're not just doing it because the teacher has told them to do it or because they need to tick a few boxes. It's because it's a real job. It's what sub-editors do in the newsroom to produce good quality journalism. We also ensure that all of our content is created in collaboration with specialist teachers, news literacy experts and journalists. We use real newsroom vocabulary throughout everything and we have an online glossary for teachers that they can refer to. We film videos of journalists talking about their jobs and the skills involved so that children can begin to understand the many roles in, that's required in news production. But we also send journalists into schools because children want to meet them in person and they have thousands of questions. So the children can actually ask the journalists the questions they want to, but the journalists also give the children feedback on the work that they have produced. And the children find that very inspiring. But we also help teachers to turn their classrooms into newsrooms. So we have teachers creating press passes for their children that they have to scan when they come into their classrooms. We have children taking on different roles, working in editorial teams, meeting tight deadlines. And all of this takes place in the context of journalist training school. So children go on a journey, they learn all of the skills required to be journalists, and at the end, they can graduate as journalists. So behind me, we have a school here in the corner who took part in Newswise, and the children are there at their graduation ceremony. They made their own mortarboards. They went to a carpet shop down the road and borrowed a red carpet. They invited their parents in and did fake news quizzes for their parents. And they also had a journalist who's hiding at the back. And he gave them certificates that were signed by the chief editor of The Guardian. So we're doing all of this to make the process of news production more transparent. We also use real news stories with the children. We don't make anything up. We know that children are accessing news all the time and they need the space to discuss it. So yes, we do use fun, light-hearted animal stories, but we also give them the chance to discuss real news about real people and issues of social justice. One of the lessons we have is on holding power to account and how the media has a role in that. And we use the example of the Windrush scandal in the UK. Teachers describe their students sitting a little taller in their seats, really stepping up to the opportunity to discuss an issue that was previously closed to them. And one teacher even told us that she saw the children really becoming citizens in front of her eyes. When we look at fake news, fake news we also use genuine examples with the children. We find examples that are age appropriate and we use that to look at all the different ways that information can be manipulated. But we don't just get the children reading real news, we also get them writing news. Because to be a critical consumer, you also have to have had the chance to produce something yourself to really understand the process that goes on behind it. So the children identify newsworthy stories from within their communities. 
They do their own research. They do their own risk assessments. They conduct their own interviews. They use authentic language and structures to report their stories from local issues and events that are happening in their school to their own unique angle on international and national topics. This really empowers the children to have a voice and shows them that their voices are just as important as everybody else's. To make it even more powerful, we help teachers to give their pupils a real audience. So we show teachers how, you, um, how they can turn their children's writing into actual newspapers, but we also publish children's reports on our website so that the children can see their work online. Perhaps most importantly for the children, we make it fun. So we tell them, right, today you're going to be fake news detectives, you're going to get your hats on, your magnifying glasses out, but what we really mean is you're going to be developing your critical thinking skills. We create games and activities without losing the seriousness of the, situ of the situation or the impact of the learning. So children love doing fake or real quizzes. There's a class at the bottom there doing one. They love learning to be fake news detectives using iPads and QR codes, looking at, inve looking at and investigating the original source of information, checking the coverage online. They also explore the consequences of fake news through activities such as mock elections. But it's not just about fake news. They also learn to sort the fact from the fiction. So children explore tweets and social media posts about breaking news stories and they work to identify which statements are opinions, rumours, speculations in order to uncover the truth. They take part in press conferences to understand the importance of balanced reporting and including a range of opinions in your reports regardless of your own opinion. And children really love bright and colourful resources. So this is our news navigator, and it gives the children a set of clues that they can use when looking at fake news. Children also take it home, and they use it with their families to begin to open up the discussions about news at home as well. Finally, we ensure that what we do is relevant. So we always use current news stories with the children, stories that we know they are curious about, stories that we know they can form their own opinions on and discuss in class. But we also make sure that it is relevant for the teachers too. So everything we do is closely mapped to the curriculum. And we heard earlier about how media literacy isn't its own topic in the curriculum. However, we show teachers that by teaching the news in this way, you are addressing many areas of the curriculum. So in English, you're covering your core writing skills, reading comprehension, you're developing your critical thinking. And in PSHE, which in the UK stands for Personal, Social, Health and Economic Education, Children explore their well-being, so they think about how does news make me feel, and if I'm engaging more with the news, how do I manage my emotions when I'm reading these stories? And in terms of online relationships, we also have a lesson on filter bubbles and targeted information. And yes, we believe that nine and ten-year-olds can absolutely learn this. Okay. So the key to everything that we do and everything we have done over the past year and a half is <laughs> suspense. Oh, that's the wrong slide. There's, you've skipped one. How do we go back? There we go. Is evaluation. So we have constantly adapted everything that we do. Everything is constantly changing. And our feedback shows us that it is working. So children and teachers completed baseline surveys, interviews and assessments. They also did um, surveys after workshops and then again at the end of the project. And it showed us that, we, that there was a real lev high level of impact on children's attitudes, behaviours in terms of news consumption. But perhaps what the most exciting thing for us is that children were just more excited and interested about the news after doing this. And that's the foundation of everything. It also had a brilliant impact on teachers. So after training, teachers felt more confident to deliver this kind of work in their classrooms. And so many teachers reported that because of Newswise, they were ex the children were engaged, excited, and energetic in the classroom. 
And to help us scale the project and make it even bigger in the UK, we have recruited volunteer teachers who work all around the country and they help promote the project to other teachers and train other teachers in their networks. So, what's next for Newswise? We want to have more teachers on board, so more volunteer teacher champions. We are going to continue to bring an audience to children's voices by, report, by publishing their reports online. And excitingly, we are now developing brand new resources for even younger children, so seven to eight year olds. And we will be using our teacher champion network to pilot and test these resources and get genuine feedback from the classroom. We are also taking our family workshops on tour, so we are hoping to reach even more families and children around the country. Okay, so I want to conclude with saying, I think it's fair to say that we learned a lot over the past year and a half. You need to be prepared to change everything and really make sure that you're listening to the teachers and children that are involved in your project. Children can be the harshest critics, however, when, they are, when you get it right, they can also be your biggest champions. So our advice to other projects is to be pragmatic. You need to build it, test it, but be prepared to rebuild it again. And always put the children or your participants, whoever they may be, at the heart of what you do. Thanks very much. Now I'd like to invite uh, the person who who is TV journalist from Poland now, but some time ago he was writing the fairy tale for children. So he knows very well how to create artificial fake stories, right? Grzegorz Nawrocki, please welcome. Hi. Hello. <coughs> I was actually giving, oh, no, that's going to be a no slide talk. Yeah, I was actually giving voices, different voices to children characters in the, in the animation movies, so. Yes, I did actually, but in fact that made-up story was supposed to bring some good to those children, which when we talk about fake news, I don't think so, I don't think they do. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Elizabeth Warren, do you know the name? Many of you do, of course, she's a, an American politician, a Democrat, and a very likely candidate in presidential elections, in the next American elections. And she has recently published a post on Facebook claiming that Mark Zuckerberg supports Donald Trump. Did you see it? No, but she actually did. And it looked very professional, I'm telling you. Uh, she placed a photograph, the two gentlemen looking at each other's eyes and shaking hands and all of it. It looked really reliable. And there it went out into the world for other people to see. She actually paid Facebook for it, you know, to, to reach an even greater audience. And it did. It actually worked very well. Only in the very last sentence did she write that it was untrue. Well, she did it, obviously, to show, to demonstrate how easily we can get manipulated by made-up stories with the help of social media. For you people here, it's absolutely obvious. There's no question about it. But for the general audience, it isn't quite. Well, uh, she actually did it to protest against the Facebook policy to exclude politicians from the anti-fake news program. Excuse me? Exclude politicians from anti-fake news program of Facebook? Come on, would we be far away from the truth to claim that it is mainly the politicians who are responsible for the spread of, spread of fake news? Either by refusing a, a proper education in their respective countries, or just by producing the, the news themselves. Well, by the way, the Pew Center the American Pew Center server says that most of the people believe it's mainly the politicians who are responsible for the fake news, but it's the responsibility, uh, responsibility of us journalists to actually combat the misinformation. Uh, but quite frankly, I don't think so. I, I don't think journalists can actually do it, do the job or win the war, whatever you call it, uh, on their own without a solid educational framework of which we're speaking a lot today. 
All right, this is big politics, but it also applies to our everyday lives and uh, our everyday choices. When Ola Svetkova, I'm not sure whether she's in, in the audience, but when she invited from the Chevening organization here in Belarus, when she invited me to, to, the, to make this short talk, she said, well, make it motivational, you know, on media, fake news and media literacy. <laughs> and I said to her, Olga, there you are. Did I tell you that? I did, in fact. You are putting me in a very difficult situation. Have mercy. Come on, it's a suicide mission. I mean, because when you look around today, things really do seem to come from bad to worse. I mean, week by week. Of all that matter, I could say tweet by tweet. Yes, I did have him in mind, if you're asking, if you're wondering. <laughs> And let's make it even clearer. Lie by lie. And for the reasons that I will not go into in detail at the moment, large masses of people are buying it, are enjoying it, are happy with it, no matter the consequences. Well, let's have fun until the music plays. But it's a rather sad constatation. Because misinformation, false information, whatever, fake news, whatever you call it, is not just an annoyance. It's, it can kill. It actually did in the past. There's nothing new about it. But uh, the mass communication media made it even more productive or effective, whatever you call it. Long time ago, when there was no internet, we didn't even have news, 24-hour news channels. A Polish scientist, a woman called Marie Skłodowska Curie, you probably know the name, She was working on a, a radioactive element called radium. Obviously, it was deadly to human health and to human life, but people didn't know about it. But it looked nice. You know, it, it sort of glowed in the darkness. It looked very cozy, as if it was a toy for children to play, play with at night. That's what it looked like. And the word of mouth spread that it had miraculous properties, like, you know, healing properties, radium. And all of a sudden, the radium craze started in France then. Believe it or not, I was surprised. I was doing a film about it. That's why I learned about it. People started to add it to just about everything. There was wa radium water. There was radium bread for people to eat. They were actually curing impotence with radium. Not very advisable today, I'm sorry you're laughing, but okay. Uh, there were spas where you could actually use radium because people didn't realize it was deadly. Only a few years later did we, did we actually realize how deadly it was when people started to die of cancer, of course, caused by radioactivity. Well, you might say it's an out-of-date example. Well, maybe. Maybe not. What we can say is that this was, remember, no internet, no television. This was basically misinformation on a relatively small scale. But has thing, have things changed that much? I mean, have a look at anti-vaccination moves, at their websites and so on and so forth. I mean, if you read them, if you believe them, and if you don't check them, You put yourselves and, and your loved ones at risk. But people do it. People do it because they cannot tell reliable sources from unreliable sources. And those sites usually look very, very professional and nicely pretend to be scientific. Next. So when she asked me why, okay, give me the title of your speech. I said, okay, let's make it sound a bit optimistic. And I came, with some, I came up with something like this. Fake a new great plague. Well, you should be smiling here. But, or laughing, rather. Okay, give it a shot. Right, I have to work harder on this. Yeah, I'll change it. The, the next, for, for the next presentation, I'll change this particular line. Anyway, you might quite rightly wonder why this gloomy title is supposed to be optimistic, but 
personally, I think that just like in medicine, when you have a good diagnosis, you're halfway to a successful treatment. That's how I would like to see it personally. I'd like to believe that we are halfway to, uh, to combat this uh, burning issue, which in many sources, and let me just make a point, reliable sources, double-checked sources, is considered to be as dangerous as racism, uh, climate change, or even terrorism. Of course, uh, you certainly know why that is. Because f false information, fake information, misinformation, doesn't only make people take bad decisions. It also makes people reluctant to accept any other facts, even if they are true, because they get completely diluted and people can't recognize them. And consequently, which is very, very sad, it destroys trust among us. It destroys, destroys trust, which is the basis of the existence of our societies, basically. We can't go on without trust, even if these are big words. We just cannot. We, be, we really become an easy target then for all those people who want to manipulate us from backstage. We normally don't see them, but we know they are there and know quite a lot about us. Remember Cambridge Analytica. They are there. Because it's always easier to manage a society that is disintegrated ignorant, misinformed, and using the language of this conference, medially illiterate, which we don't want. So I think, are we, should we finish, yes? Okay. I'll tell you what then. I think, honestly, personally, I think we should send a very strong voice and a very strong message, message from, from, from this conference, symbolic message from Minsk today, if you'd like to join me. And I think it would just be a great idea to start together, as we sit together in this room today, to start a new global initiative, a new global move, a campaign together. A campaign, this time targeted precisely at local governments, because they are very often responsible for education, uh, at local councils, and also NGOs that are interested in this subject in all the respective countries that we are representing today. This campaign could bear a very nice name, which, I came, which we came up together with my colleagues, Global Media Literacy Dialogue, Verbi Valor, which in Latin means the value of words. Well, I don't know whether you are interested in this or not, but I would be very, very welcome to talk to you afterwards. And any organization, any of you who would like to take part in this initiative would be very welcome. Two or three organizations from different countries would be just enough. And I'm just bringing you a message or, or a declaration from Poland from one of the largest NGOs that is there on the market in Poland in terms of digital education. This NGO is called Cities on Internet Association, a great big think tank, that they will give us all help we need, that will support us and give us a sort of help when, if, if we decide to start. And I think it's an excellent idea if, 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 if you like it. So if you would like to declare that you would like to become a part of this move, create this initiative, I think it would just be a great outcome of this meeting, of this conference. We all have great networking possibilities, of course, all around the world. And if we join efforts, I think something very, very sensible might come out of it. Because I believe and I'm sure that we still care about verbi valor, the value of words. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite now Sarah Lange, or Sarah Lange. How, how should I pronounce it correctly? So I like both. Uh, 
but Sarah, I asked Sarah, what is an interesting fact about you? And she said, like, mm, there, is, there are many. No, actually, she didn't think. She just said that I'm kayaking. And I think uh, we have the best kayaker in the room, but also the best expert on the, yeah, kayak, you know, like small boats, trowniki. Na trowniku kataca, parishce v ozere more akijanja. So Sarah will, uh, will tell her story. Please, Sarah, welcome to the stage. Okay, so I'm the last one, I believe. I get the pleasure of being last after everyone's in a little tired. So if we need five seconds to stretch, twist and turn, please take your five seconds and, <laughs> and move a little bit. I will really give you five seconds and then I'll start. So my name is Sarah Lange and my specialty is transforming communication environments in the most difficult places in the world. And that means changing habits, changing mindsets, and bringing more secure communication practices to people who need them most. And just as a side note, we have determined that journalists are the worst possible group to work with. Uh, you do have that distinct honor. So please don't come and ask me for training. But anything else afterwards, I'm open to talk about. Just kidding. So what I want to talk about today is something that I know is a bit of a risk in this room of journalists and educators and academics and activists who are here to talk about media literacy, and it is giving up media, the media fast. So 14 months ago, almost to the day, I turned the media off. And I'm not talking about just ignoring what someone is yelling about or tuning out a particular story, I mean I turned it completely off. No newspapers, no BBC, no CNN, no Facebook, no Twitter, no Instagram, nothing. I even turned the radio off. And I am a self-professed newsaholic. I make it my business to know things. When I was a teenager, I was the weird kid in the 1993 gold Buick LeSabre, which is a huge car, very old, blasting the latest newscast out my window when I rolled up to school. In college, I was the kid with the Economist under one arm and the New York Times under the other, sitting at breakfast, trying to understand what was going on in the world. And in my professional life, my business is to know things, to know what's happening, what's evolving, what's changing. And for the first time in my life, last year, I was experiencing something that I don't think is unique just to me. Complete and utter political apathy. I mean absolute political apathy. Has anyone else in here experienced political apathy in the last year by chance? At least a few of us, and I'm sure there are a couple more of us in this room. So apathy is something that <clears throat> is usually talked about when we're discussing civic engagement, lack of voter turnout, lack of youth participation in our political systems. It's something that usually happens, for me at least, to other people. So the day I turned the news off, this guy was yelling. And admittedly, it wasn't that hard. This is where I live. So I did turn to my kayak, and I turned the news off. So apathy is actually one of the most toxic and insidious threats to a healthy system of government. When we start tuning out, we let other people decide for us. When we choose not to participate, we allow other people who may be minorities or who may have radical views start to change, morph the system, and that's when things can go awry. Apathy is bad. Will these videos play? Anybody know if these videos will play? No? no nobody? <laughs> okay, we'll go on. <clears throat> so what I noticed is that there's a lot of noise in our system. There's a lot of noise, 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 noise in the news that we're consuming, the information that we're intaking every day. And that's really the point is noise. In fact, one of the most effective techniques of disinformation campaigns is to simply flood the system with so much noise 
that it's very difficult to know what's real and not real and not real. It's very difficult to understand what we need to pay attention to and what we can tune out. And when there's so much noise, our brains actually start to do this instinctively. Subconsciously, we tune out information because we can't process all of it at one time. And when we aren't choosing to tune out information, and it's being tuned out for us, and people who are running disinformation campaigns, they do this very specifically, it doesn't allow us to pay attention to the right things. So the idea was that this is really noisy and that it's hard to pay attention during noise, but um, we'll, we'll move on. So while I was thinking about this problem, I was wondering if it's really something new or if it's just something that we hype up that feels different because it looks different, if this excess of overstimulation and hyper-informed state of our society is really something different than it is maybe 20 years ago. And there's a researcher in Southern California, this is his name, and he and his research team determined that on average, every day, we consume at least five times more information than we did just 20 years ago. And that number is going up every single day. That is a lot of information. So disinformation tactics work by manipulating, manipulating our emotions and manipulating our reactions. We create a lot of noise, we turn out, we tune out, and then something really interesting happens. Our emotions become vulnerable. When we are hyper-stimulated and we are receiving all of that noise, our brains actually shift from the rational, critical thinking part of our brain to the primal part of our brain. It's also called the lizard brain. And when we move into that space in the lizard brain, do you know what gets our attention? Anger, astonishment, disgust, really strong visceral physical emotions that we are biologically programmed to pay attention to. And people who are creating disinformation campaigns and all of that noise, and this includes advertisers or people who are developing clickbait, they use those emotions against us in order to get our attention in that hyper-noisy environment. And we do. We do pay attention to the story of Jason Derulo falling down the steps, which wasn't really true. But we look at that because it's astonishing. We click on things that are gross. And whether we intend to do that or not, it is a byproduct of this noisy environment, unless we're intentional about it. So, what do we do about this? So, well, I went to high school in a place called Kentucky. It's deep in the hills, it's a hundred miles away from any shopping center, and there are more churches than restaurants. So it's a pretty conservative place. And in sex ed class, we learned one concept, and only one concept, which doesn't apply to real life. In fact, it's very ineffective in real life for what it was intended for. But in this case, it has a purpose. Abstinence works 100% of the time, every time. So, I know again it's risky to say that abstaining from the media to this audience is bizarre, but I have a little experiment and it's not going to work. But when this guy is talking, and this is a great clip of him tirading about something, when we turn it off, I mean, turn it off, silence it, all of a sudden, all of those words are harmless. They're rendered completely meaningless. It has no impact on us, it doesn't affect our emotions, it doesn't manipulate us, it doesn't crowd our minds that should be creating and innovating and problem solving with noise. All of a sudden, that silence is what we gain when we tune that out. I was in the park a couple of weeks ago with my little kids and I met an Estonian diplomat who just left the Foreign Service. And she was burnt out, she was tired, she was thinking that the work that she was doing all of the time, responding to emergencies of politicians, and they work closely with our government, I'm sorry to say, and a lot of them were created by our government in the United States. She wasn't feeling like anything she was doing mattered anymore. And so she left. And she said to me, if we hope to fix anything in this system, we have to fix ourselves first. And I truly believe that. 
We as individuals need to be resilient to the tactics that are being used to manipulate the way we think, the way we consume information. And I have a proposal for how you can do that in three steps. Try a media fast. So the first thing to do is decide how long you're going to do it for. A week, a month, 14 months. And turn it off. And turn, it, turn it all off and see what happens. And I learned something really interesting when I turned the media off. This practice of physical deprivation is used by all sorts of cultures and religions to cleanse the body and the mind. <clears throat> In the Catholic faith, we fast and we give up things during the period of Lent to restore our balance. And this is similar to what I'm prescribing here. When you challenge yourself to a media fast, sorry, go back. Okay. The things that I noticed were nothing bad happened. That's the truth. And maybe many of us might fear something happening if we turn the media off for a little while. But I didn't miss anything. I had a little bit of FOMO, which I didn't know what that meant until recently, but a fear of missing out. But what happened was that I tuned in to my colleagues, my friends, and my family, and I started having more conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations. Number two was, I didn't miss anything. And I was informed. Through my network, I allowed myself to hear of a story through my physical, in-person network, and then go and check it on a reliable source online. And I was able to find out the information that I needed for my life that mattered to me. And number three, is that I had more time to do the things that build my personal resilience to stress. And we all have those things. And I find myself more creative, and I started producing more than I was consuming. And that's a huge transition. I think all of us could take a step in pursuing. So after you've fasted, then we go on the exclusion diet. And I'm almost done, two, more, two minutes. The exclusion diet is something practiced by people who have allergies. So basically, you give everything up, to decide what allergen you're experiencing, and you add foods back into your diet one by one. And when you do that, you notice some things. So when we're doing that for the media, ask yourself these questions. As you add a media outlet back into your life, when you consume information, how does it make you feel? If it makes you feel horrible, keep it out. You don't have to consume that information. Number two, or number one and one is after you've consumed information and you're walking away, are you ready to use that information and have a meaningful conversation and debate or engagement with other people? Has it filled you up? Has it actually educated you? Does it serve your purposes? And if it isn't, and it's something that my Aunt Betty does, and it's something you take in and you read it and you go, mm-hmm, I knew he was guilty. Yeah, I could have told you that, mm-hmm. If it's a head nod kind of situation, that's not the information you should be wasting your time with. That's just noise. And number three is, are you intentionally consuming information to support your relationships and your work? And if not, it should be for entertainment. And if it doesn't hit that button, it's just noise. And it's taking away creative space that we have, which is a limited product, to solve these really hard and big problems. So lastly, what we're doing when we're making these, in these intentional decisions is designing our own information ecosystem. So on average, adults spend 11 hours, 11 hours a day on a screen. And if we spent that much time in any physical space, we would design it with intention and purpose. And so we really want something that looks like this? Maybe. But I'm far more drawn to this. And when I'm in that space, I feel good. I feel creative. I feel empowered. I feel innovative. And I can actually come up with solutions I wouldn't have seen otherwise. And when you're designing that system, do it with intention. Don't let it happen to you. And if you're already in an ecosystem that's weighed down, think about doing a little spring cleaning. Get the excess out and create space for your own creativity. So finally, as a last thought, is that in this crazy, noisy world, that we can intentionally intake information. And when we do that, and we're creative, and we're critically thinking about information, those tactics of disinformation strategies, of creating apathy, and noise, and overwhelm, and distraction, are rendered harmless. They don't have any impact on us. And we can be our own bastions of creativity and calm, and 
I think that's how we win the war against disinformation in the long term. So thank you so much for paying attention during this last presentation. I really appreciate it. Thank you.